Dave Kilmister, <laughs> welcome to Australian Musician. Thank you very much. Uh, you're in town with Roger Waters on the Us and Them tour. Mm -hmm. uh, how is the Australian leg of the tour going so far? It's going very well, actually. Uh, Roger's very happy. Um, in fact, he said the other night, I think it was the, the, sec the first night in Brisbane, um, walked off stage and said, this, you know, this is sounding really, really good. He's, he's, very, uh, he's very excited and uh, happy. And we love it when the boss is happy, basically. Um, not that we weren't happy last year, but I guess because it's still such a, um, a new band, it's still very fresh. Uh, there's, it's still um, improving in leaps and bounds, I guess. So. With so much production and the visual, visuals and the lighting, is it difficult to distinguish one show from another? Can, can you feel when it's a really hot show? Um, I guess I, I only judge it on my own personal um, playing. And usually when I have a really good show, everyone else is saying that they've had a really terrible one. But this was kind of unusual in that I felt that that show was really good and Roger was really happy and um, Joey and Gus seem to have, be having a good time. And um, Yeah, I mean, the, the differences between a good show and a great show from an audience point of view is probably, you know, three or four percent, I guess. Um, but that's kind of what you work towards, you know. The, the little things that I that I'm working on every night, they're, they're just, they're tiny, you know, but the difference, that, that just makes a difference to me whether it's a good night or a bad night, whether it's a particularly nice bend I did on one uh, tune or whether the vibrato was particularly good somewhere or whether the guitar was kind of feeding back nicely. It's uh, tiny little things that make me happy that most of the audience are completely oblivious to. Yeah. Uh, let's go back a little while. Um, when did tone, guitar tone, become significant to you as opposed to the kind of guitar you wanted to play or the amp? Tone, it's always been significant. Um, music is sound. Um, and I discovered a very long time ago that people would rather hear an average guitarist with a nice sound than an incredible guitarist with a shit sound. <laughs> you know, so I. I think it's, I'll give you an example. When I used to teach, um, I would go into the room and we would use the same amps as the students and you could always tell when the students had used the amps because they turned up the distortion, they turned up the reverb so that it was physically easy to play. You know, it kind of covered up all the mistakes and all the, uh, the technique problems, you know. But I can't think of any other instrumentalists that do that, where they actually get a sound that feels comfortable as opposed to a, so a sound that sounds nice. Um, I don't know why guitarists do that at all, because most, maybe it's just laziness, I have no idea. You know, you can, um, you can put on a wow pedal and kind of do that and get away with murder live, you really can. And, and some people do, not mentioning any names whatsoever. But I just think, you know, the, the sound is where it comes from. You know, the sound is, it starts in your head to begin with. And then you try and find equipment that uh, actually produces that noise. Um, and I guess it's also a, um, a byproduct of things that you've listened to that you like. I mean, I grew up listening to people like, uh, Brian May and Van Halen. I mean, those two guys right there, that's just, that's two incredible guitar sounds. You know, so I guess if, if, uh, if I'm aiming for somewhere in my head, I guess it would be kind of between those two. Yeah. A lot of people uh, assume that uh, you must have been a, a Pink Floyd uh, <laughs> nut growing up, um, which is not necessarily the case. It's not exactly the case, no. No. Um, how, how, <laughs> <laughs> obviously you love Hides what you're shame. doing and appreciate <laughs> being in this marvellous band, but who would have been that childhood dream band that you would have aspired to play in? Oh. Um, Queen, probably. They were my favourite band growing up. They were the, probably the biggest musical influence. 
I have. Um, Led Zeppelin would have been a, a close second as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just when I was growing up, I was just listening to heavier things, faster things. <laughs> I kind of missed, uh, I missed a lot of the progressive music out. Um, not on purpose, obviously, but uh, one of the first albums I got was um, Jeff Beck, Wired, which kind of introduced me to jazz rock and fusion. And so I was listening to all, all kinds of stuff. Black Sabbath I was listening to. Um, pretty much anything that was on the radio in the 70s, um, which was just such an eclectic mix. You know, one you'd have 10CC or the Eagles or Bob Marley, Michael Jackson, you know, in one program. <laughs> and it was just, I loved it all. So um, that was, that was what I was aware of. And Pink Floyd, apart from Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, that was, um, I think that was the only thing I ever heard on, on British radio. So that was the only tune I was really aware of. I mean, I toured Dark Side of the Moon at a friend's house once, which I, I, you know, I thought it was great, but I was, I was trying to improve technique. I was trying to, you know, play faster and louder and heavier stuff. So <laughs> I didn't really pursue that uh, that avenue at that time. I think a lot of guitarists tend to uh, run before they can walk. I guess. You know, a lot of young guitarists, they pick up the guitar and they want to play as fast as possible and then later on as their taste develops, then they sort of start to appreciate the finer points of uh, guitar playing. You know, being able to bend in tune, nice vibrato, stuff like that, phrasing. I believe that the uh, Roger Waters audition was quite a <laughs> stressful moment for you. It was very stressful. I mean, I, I wasn't too stressed. Um, because, you know, I wasn't really aware of, of the uh, magnitude of this uh, audition. And it slowly dawned on me as, as we were going through some of the tunes. And, and I just had all sorts of stupid um, technical problems. You know, I, I brought my own acoustic and we plugged the acoustic in and... Why is that not working? I've got a new battery in. There's, you know, so I had text running around trying to fix that, and then um, I don't. I think I was. I brought my amp, and that didn't seem to be happy either. So I ended up using another amp, and I had two guitars. One specifically had 22 frets, so I could play Money. And of course, we started playing Money, and I realised I've got actually got the wrong guitar, and I've got 21 frets, and I can't play the solo on it. So it's like stop. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just hopelessly unprepared, and I just. I just walked out of that room just thinking, Dave, you've just blown the biggest opportunity of your life, you idiot. I was really quite depressed driving home, um, but I guess they saw something. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just, um, it was probably when we finally did the money solo, and I was, you know, all that sort of pent up aggression and, not aggression, that's the wrong word, frustration. That's the, that's the word. Um, I think it probably just came out on that end solo. And apparently, I, I heard afterwards that, you know, I started playing the solo and everyone was like, whoa, okay. Because <laughs> there was a lot of attitude in that. Um, yeah, just the frustrations of the day and just being annoyed with myself, feeling very, very unprepared. Um, I thought I was prepared going in and then I just realised that I wasn't at all. Especially when um, we were about to start doing money and I'd learned all the three rhythm guitar parts. You know, there's one that goes dun 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 dun. There's the one, that, the, the funky one, the um, funky, it's kind of a, more of a reggae thing, I suppose. Da 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 da. Or there's one that does the, um, the vibrato, Thing. So you're just playing the single notes, it's going down. So I was like, okay, yeah, I can. which one do you want me to do? And, and Roger said, um, I don't mind, but you were right on the lyrics. I'm like, I'm supposed to sing this, 
Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. I, d I just... I just had no idea. I just felt so stupid. Um, I mean, I knew they were looking for someone to to sing and play, or to, you know, at least to sing David's parts. But I didn't know that David sang money, you know, because I just wasn't um, a fan. <laughs> Not that I didn't like it, but I just, you know, obviously Uber fans would would know would know all this stuff, and I just walked in and. No, not a clue. Disastrous. Utterly, utterly disastrous. Well, obviously not disastrous because they liked me, but... So, uh, you've been playing with Roger for over 10 years now. Um, yes, 12 years. Yeah. So, playing those iconic solos, are you surprised by the reverence and the, the comments uh, by fans? Um, not really surprised. I mean, it's it's one of the biggest albums of all time, isn't it, Dark Side? It still sells ridiculous amounts. And I would never want to mess with those solos. You know, I just try and play them as close to the record as possible. I'm not gonna try and put my own, I mean, I put my own energy into it and my own passion. Um, but in the same way as you do if you're a, a classical musician and you have the piece of music in front of you and you try and play that with with your heart and soul, but you're not going to start changing, changing bits and pieces, you know. And um, the fans have been very good to me, to be fair, because um, I know they've been they they can be quite um, fussy, <laughs> as uh, as I'm sure I would be. Um, so yeah, I just try and you know keep it as close to the record as possible. Um, and it, they still stand up. They still they're still great solos. You know the thing on. The solo on Another Brick in the Wall is just it's one of the best solos ever, I think. You know, the phrasing on it is, is just gorgeous. So, um, yeah, I still have fun doing it, so. Um, let's talk a little bit about the gear that you're using mm -hmm. on this tour. Um, do you enjoy uh, preparing a pedal board for a tour like this? Is that something you, you get into, or is it just a task? Uh, <laughs> enjoy. Um, I don't mind it. I mean, it's it's uh, good research, I guess. I mean, this for this particular tour, I decided that I wanted to get a little closer to some of the effects that David used. Um, and but I didn't have a clue about things like Univibes and stuff like that. So I'd go online and look at people's comments about certain pedals, and then go and try a couple and and see which one. I felt produced the best noise, so um, yeah, the, the, the research, I guess it's kind of fun. Is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I guess there's a certain, um, I'm fairly ignorant with, with certain um, effects. I, I've never really got into effects that, uh, that much. I was always trying to get different sounds out of the guitar just using my hands. You know, the similar similar approach, I guess, to Van Halen, where you're trying to get lots of silly sounds and stuff, but it was just different playing techniques. So I'd never really looked at it. I mean, even delay pedals, I just, okay. I can see that they're a nice thing. Brian May uses it incredibly well. Um, but yeah, so it was a, a huge learning curve for me this time, because I, I just wanted to get the, the effects a little better. I wanted to get a, a decent pedal board for a change, because on the wall, I had, you know, this really very, very basic four or five pedals that were essentially nailed to a bit of wood, um, and I was obviously losing signal, and I didn't wasn't really aware of that, and I was getting noise, and didn't have isolated power and all that kind of stuff, you know. So um, my good friend Daniel Steinhardt at Gig Rig was um, invaluable at helping me uh, put all this stuff together. So we sat down one afternoon and I sort of told him what sort of pedals I wanted and um, he suggested one or two other things. Um, I trust his, his opinion implicitly, so that was, that was really handy as well. Um, so I guess it's fun. When, when it's all set up, it's fun. The, trying to get the, the right delays and the right reverbs and stuff, I don't know. It's, it's not really playing, it's just fiddling, really. I don't <laughs> 
And does Roger give you a, a brief or any uh, comments on, on the sound? Um, if he doesn't like it, then you will know very quickly. In fact, there's no black and white. Um, um, but other than that, no, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't care what I use as long as it sounds good. And he's, he's been, actually, he's not really said much to me, which when I first started playing with him, I thought, you know, he keeps talking to these other guys and he's not really saying anything to me. And then someone pointed out, that's actually a really good thing because that means you're doing, it, you're doing a good job. He's talking to these other guys because he's not happy with them. Like, ah, okay, cool. So um, I, get, I get scared if he comes over and talks to me now, though. Uh, <laughs> um, what about guitars? How many guitars do you take on the road? Um, like I've got four Sirs on stage. Um, I'm kind of only re really using two of them. They're all guitars that I've um, that I sort of designed and got the good people at Sura to put together for me. Uh, they're based on a Telecaster shape because I just find that, that that shape fits really well into my body. Um, but I also like the versatility of having three pickups and a tremolo. So they're kind of, you know, essentially a cross between a Strat and a Telecaster. I don't know why Fender have never really done that before. You know, they've kind of produced the Strats and Tellys and they've not really cross-fertilised, um, which seems seems a little crazy to me. So anyway, the, that's kind of... <laughs> That's the forces that I use. Um, I only really use two of them, as I said. One of the one of them I use for everything except for dogs, which is uh, slightly detuned. That's a tone lower, so I use one of the other sirs for that. And then the other two are just backups. And I have two Martins, um, a six string and a twelve string, so that I can play uh, "Wish You Were Here" and "Welcome to the Machine" and "Mother" and things like that. Yeah. Um, and you're playing through the Brunetti. I am. Yeah. Yeah. What is it that you, just you enjoy about that? <laughs> it's the sound of God. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. They just, they just sound amazing. They, they unlike a lot of other amps, um, they don't actually colour the sound. You know, I'd, I'm, for example, if you plug into a Mesa Boogie, you will get the Mesa Boogie sound, whether you like it or not. <laughs> it will give you that sound. Whereas for me, the brunettes are just, they just amplify the sound of the guitar, which is kind of all you really want. Um, and they're, you know, they're very, they're brutally honest. I mean, if you play shit, then it will sound shit. But um, I try not to do that. Um, I think the, the first thing that struck me about them, though, was that. Um, it was coming up to the, uh, the wall tour, and I wanted to get an amp that could produce an amazing overdrive sound and a beautiful clean sound. And I couldn't find one anywhere. And I was worried that I'd have to go into this Eric Johnson territory where you have separate rigs for, for, the, for the different sounds. And then I just happened upon this, this Brunetti combo, actually, it's a Mercury combo. And I plugged it in, and the first thing I heard was the clean sound, I thought, Oh my God, that's just, that's beautiful. It's not really, you know, some, some of the Fender amps can sound a little harsh um, when, when you use the clean sound. Uh, but this just sounded really warm and musical, but you still had all the highs. And so I thought I could probably use this just for the clean sound. And then I switched the overdrive on. I'm like, oh my God, this does it, this does everything. So um, yeah, I contacted Marco. Um, who's just such a lovely guy, and he uh, he suggested using the um, the amps, the Mercury amps instead of the combos. Um, and I can't see myself ever using anything else ever again, to be honest. I've been using the same amps since uh, 2010 now. Um, I did all the wall shows. I did all the the gigs with Stephen Wilson, and now. All the shows last year on the SM tour, and they just they still sound wonderful. I don't even very rarely sort of retube them. Um, they just they just rock. It's incredible. 
So, <clears throat> is it a versatile amp if you were doing a pub gig? Yes. Uh, you'd use the Brunetti as well? I would, definitely. I mean, the only thing I had added was um, I've got a switch on the back that takes it from 50 watts to 20 watts because, um, because they are so well made, so ridiculously well made. You, you put it on 50 watts and it just, it just um, it's way louder than any other 50 watt you've ever heard because it's just, um, it's made properly, so everything's working properly. Um, and on 50 watts, we were when we were doing um, our rehearsals, our production rehearsals in this uh, in this place in New Jersey. I mean, it was a, essentially a twelve thousand seater arena. And our sound guy comes up to me. He says, "I can't get my PA over the sound of your amps. Can you please turn them down?" <laughs> so, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll switch them down to twenty watts. All right. Um, and they're still ridiculously loud. They're still, um, but it's a it's a it's not a nasty loud, it's a warm, amazing loud, you know. Um, there's just something about them, and, and also being valves as well. Um, valve amps is, is just, I've not heard any digital things that really come close. I mean, they sort of come close, I guess, when you're recording, but it's just, there's just something, something missing. I tried, um, I did a pub gig once, I had this 100 watt modelling amp and I took it along to this pub gig and I cranked it flat out because it was really, I was struggling to get over the drums and the sound guy came up to us afterwards, he said, oh thank you so much for keeping the sound down, you know, for the, for the show, I said, that was 100 watts and that was flat out <laughs> and I just couldn't hear it, this is something, you know, it's the analog versus digital thing there's some there's just something missing um which you can only really tell when you sit on stage you know the analog thing you can actually feel the sound behind you there's something very present there and to me the digital thing always sounds like it's parked next door somewhere and you just i don't know i'm sure they'll get close you know they're getting closer i'm sure they'll get it eventually uh, tell me about the musical relationship on stage with uh, Jonathan Wilson. Um, do you compare notes? Do you debrief after a gig? No. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, uh, I think I asked, it probably maybe the first time, actually, as we were walking off after the first set, he said, oh, how's that for you? He said, yeah, that was pretty good. And I said, yeah, that was good. And that was... That's pretty much as far as it goes. Um, um, we had, uh, you know, we spent a time, we had about a month's rehearsals last year before the, before the tour started, last April. Um, and my, I guess most of that time was just spent trying to get the sounds kind of as authentic as possible. I mean, some of the crew were sort of tearing their hair out because the new guys were bringing in all these you know, tape echoes and stuff like that. And they're looking at these things thinking, you know, they were unreliable when they came out. <laughs> you know, these things are gonna fall apart in a, in a week. Um, and the thing that you do need on, on, on a tour like this is, is um, well, two things, actually, reliability and consistency, you know, so that you just sound the same. Everything works and everything just sounds the same as it did the previous night. So the same guy's not tearing his hair out and saying, what's What's that guitar going on? You know, so there was a bit of uh, sorting out with gear to begin with. But um, no, Jonathan's been great. He's, he's, um, I took him through one or two little parts when we first got together. You know, some of the, some of the phrasing bits in Money, because we both play that uh, unison, the first and the third solos. Um, but no, he's fine. He's, uh, He's got his he's got his own style. He's he's got a couple of solos on some of the stuff off the new album. Um, no, we don't really talk about guitars, actually. Strangely, I don't know. It's just, I mean, I know that him and and also Gus they're, they're kind of obsessed with guitars in a way. I mean, we'll get to a place like uh, like Melbourne and they'll go around the second end music shops and picking up these old bits of 
junk or whatever, and it makes them really happy. But um, for me, I guess I've I've got everything that I I need at the moment. So um, oh, the other the only other guitar I haven't mentioned, which I kind of carry around with me, is this thing, which is just an Anderson. Um, there's just something about this guitar which makes me happy. It's um, obviously tally shaped. The the P90s are just they're just gorgeous. A little bit noisy, unfortunately, but they're just gorgeous. So this is a guitar I actually carry around with me all the time and um, do a lot of writing on, or just warming up in um, backstage, or just have it in my room to stop me going insane. Really. So um, what is happening with your uh, solo career? Uh, Two thousand fourteen <laughs> was the last. Album. That's a very good question. Um, the problem is people keep offering me work and it's difficult to turn down work to to sit around and record your own stuff. Um, at the moment we've got dates up until December, I think, with Roger. Uh, finish, uh, I believe we finish in Mexico City. Um, and I'll probably need a holiday around about that time. Um, so I'm thinking to go back to a place that I went to last year. Um, because there's something very depressing about finishing a tour in December in a really warm place and then going home to snow and rain and Christmas music. And <laughs> it's just like, no, make it stop. So I might even do something slightly different and spend a Christmas on a beach this year. Um, and then we're into next year. And, you know, so I'm not entirely sure what's happening. At the moment, I'm, I'm still writing. Um, I've got way too many song ideas. I've got over 500 song ideas on my phone at the moment. Um, I counted the other day. They're just little bits, little phrases, little chorus ideas. So really, as soon as we get a break, I'm just going to sit down and, and go through that and, and do another album. I, I desperately want to do another album because I think I've learned so much since, since the last one. And. Um, it's kind of what you leave behind as well, isn't it? You know, I'm not getting any, I'm not getting any younger, and I've been around for a long time, and only produced maybe three or four albums. It's, yeah, I need to, I need to do some more stuff really, but, you know, I don't know how much, to, how much longer this tour is going to go, though, no. uh, and you just can't turn down things like this. It's just. Uh, <laughs> It's just too amazing for words, really. Yeah. So what's left to do? Any, any bucket list items that you want to tick off? Um, do you mean playing-wise, music-wise? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I definitely want to do some more albums because I think I have my own style. Um, I don't want to be just known as a as Dave Gilmore stunt double, you know, because I think there's more to me than that. Uh, well, I know there is. <laughs> and I think um, the music that I create is, is kind of unique, so I, I want to get more of that out there. Um, I guess that's kind of it, really. I mean, I'm always up for uh, any interesting uh, collaborations or, or whatever. Um, playing with Stephen Wilson um, was amazing. It was, it was very interesting to see how he worked. Um, and I, I, wasn't necess I wasn't aware of his music until I went to see a concert because um, my friend Guthrie was playing guitar with him. And um, they were playing stuff from The Raven, which is just one of the you know, it's just one of the best albums of the last 20 years. It's just incredible. And so that was quite inspirational to hear someone playing, um, using influences from progressive rock, but actually making it sound fresh and unique. And uh, I thought, yeah, maybe I can use some of those. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned before that I missed out on a lot of progressive rock. I mean, I didn't, I missed, completely missed bands like Genesis and Gentle Giant and a whole bunch of others, but I kind of, I heard yes, which is kind of interesting. 
And um, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, obviously, being a frustrated piano player, um, I was very aware of their music. But um, there was a whole bunch of other stuff that I missed out. So, uh, um, so it's, it's kind of it would be nice to revisit some of that because some of that is still amazing, and and use that as inspiration for the next uh, for my next batch of songs. Um, yeah, I mean, it'd be great to have a hit album. That would be a wonderful thing. I don't feel the need to um, go out as a solo artist necessarily, though. I think the pressure is just ridiculous. I'm quite happy being the side person, really. You know, when it's your name, then, you know, all the responsibility is on your shoulders. And as much as I love singing and I love playing, I, if, you know, if my voice went for one night, I just, yeah. Uh, no, I don't, I don't feel a need to do that anyway. I've always wanted to be just part of a, an amazing band. I, I never wanted to be a solo artist. I wanted to be in something like, something like Queen or Led Zeppelin or um, Van Halen, where you're just part of a, part of a unit. Um, so I could never be a, a sort of a Jeff Buckley type character as much as, as much as I wish my voice would do those things. <laughs> Right, Dave uh, Kilminster, thanks for your time. Thank you very much.